pop quiz. What do Candle Mass, the Christian holiday, St. Bridget's Day, the Irish holiday, Haram Nitsa, the Czech holiday, and Groundhog Day, the bizarre North American rodent watching custom, all have in common, apart from taking place in early February? Turns out they're all rooted in the same ancient Celtic festival. In bulk. Yes, the reason why a bunch of old dudes in top hats freeze their butts off every February 2nd while groping a groundhog with a goofy name, Puxatani Phil, is because, well, I mean, of course they're checking to see if the groundhog sees its shadow. Because Pennsylvania Dutch superstition dictates that if on the 2nd of February the sun is shining, thus allowing the groundhog to see its shadow, six more weeks of wintry weather will ensue. Oppositely, if there is no groundhog shadow to be seen on account of cloud cover, spring like weather is right around the corner. This might be common folkloric forecasting knowledge for many of you, but where did this superstition come from? Well, as I already mentioned, the Pennsylvania Dutch. Funny thing about the Pennsylvania Dutch, they were actually Germans who described themselves as Deutsch. You know how Germany is actually called Deutschland in German. So there was a bit of a translation error. Regardless, the groundhog superstition is no doubt rooted in an older tradition from German-speaking regions of Europe, where the badger, or dox in German, was the preferred mammal for making meteorological predictions. My hunch is this is why Groundhog Day is referred to as Dox Day in Nova Scotia. But I digress. The German badger watching tradition evolved from an older Christian superstition that said clear weather on the feast day of Candlemas, held on February 2nd, was a portent of winter's prolongment. And how, dare I ask, did this Candlemas custom get its start? We've finally gone back far enough that I can answer in bulk. What is Imbolc? Also known as Imbolg, spelled with a G, Imbolc marks the midway point between the winter solstice and the spring equinox. It was a pastoral festival celebrated among the ancient Gaelic Celts to welcome the beginning of spring. According to professor and folklorist Julian Osborne McKnight, author of the 2015 book The Story We Carry in Our Bones, Irish History for Americans, the name Imbolc is derived from the Irish I Mbolg, which translates to in the hold or belly, a reference to, and I quote, pregnant ewes who gave birth to lambs in early spring, end quote. An alternate theory put forth by the 9th century Bishop King Cormac Mac Coulinan holds that Imbolc stems from the Irish word oimelk, meaning beginning of spring, which in turn was derived from the Irish oi melg, meaning ewe milk. That's according to his Sanus Cormac the glossary of Cormac. Precise etymology aside, it's clear that the Feast of Imbolc has long been associated with that time in late winter when female sheep, quote, come into their milk. In fact, this association is made reference to in the Tain Bo Cooley, the cattle raid of Cooley, an Irish epic, part of the Ulster cycle of Irish mythology, that dates back to at least the 7th century. In the story, the famed Irish warrior Cuculin attempts to woo a woman named Emmer. Looking down at her dress, he says, I see a sweet country. I could rest my weapon there. In response, Emmer proceeds to list the tasks Cuculin must perform before she'll allow him to unsheath his, uh, weapon. This list of tasks includes the following, and I quote, No man will travel this country who hasn't gone sleepless from Samhain, Halloween, when summer goes to its rest, until Imbolc, Candlemas, or Groundhog Day, when the ewes are milked at spring's beginning. And that was from scholar Thomas Cahill's 1995 book, How the Irish Saved Civilization. Imbolc's association with ewes coming into their milk made the feast a natural natural fit for dedication to the triune Irish goddess Brigid, who also had counterparts in Gaul as Brigindo and Britain as Brigantia. Here's how Osborne McKnight explains the Brigid Imbolc connection. And I quote, Because lambs are the origin of the holiday, it was dedicated to Brigid slash Anu slash Dana, a three-faceted goddess and protector of everything creative. The primary figure of the trinity was Brigid. She protected ewes, hearth fires, poetry, blacksmiths, pregnant women, and midwives. In ancient times, it was believed that she would visit and bless the hearths of the people, leaving her footprints in the ashes. Because Imbolc signified spring and a return to light, the festival utilized candles and hearth fires as symbols of hope. With the arrival of Christianity, many of the qualities and characteristics of the Irish fertility goddess Brigid were transferred to St. Brigid of Kildare, including the goddess's feast day. The daughter of a druid slash chieftain, St. Brigid founded the monastery at Kildare on the site of a pagan shrine dedicated to her namesake. Some scholars, including Irish archaeologist R.A.S. McAllister, contend that St. Brigid was a priestess of the cult of the goddess Brigid before she converted to Christianity. While Imbolc would widely become known as St. Brigid's Day, 
day in the Gaelic worlds, including in Ireland, Scotland, and the Isle of Man, the pastoral association did not change. To quote Irish folklorist Sean O'Sullivan, the main significance of the Feast of St. Bridget would seem to be that it was a Christianization of one of the focal points of the agricultural year in Ireland, the starting point of preparations for the spring sowing. Every manifestation of the cult of the saint or of the deity she replaced is closely bound up in some way with food production, and this must be the chief line of approach to a study of the spring festival. And that comes from the Journal of the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland. 1945. When did the ancient Celts celebrate Imbolc? The short answer, the ancient Celts celebrated Imbolc on February 1st, which is a cross-quarter day, i.e. a midpoint between a solstice and an equinox. These liminal times were revered by the ancient Celts. As folklorist Don Yoder explains in his 2003 book Groundhog Day, the seasonal turning points in the Celtic year were immensely important communal festivals and prehistoric pre-Christian times. Of these festivals, the dates have continued to be important down to present time, though the celebrations were transformed by the medieval church into, and this is in quotes, Christian holidays. The four turning points of the Celtic year were November 1st, February 1st, May 1st, and August 1st. The year began with November 1st, the Celtic New Year, and ended with the Harvest Festival of August 1st. The Celtic names for the four festivals were Samhain, Imbolc, Beltane, and Lunasa, end quote. However, while it makes sense for us to peg February 1st as the date for Imbolc, given how we measure days, the ancient Celts did things a bit differently. They measured their days from evening to evening. Hence, it would be more accurate to say that Imbolc begins on the evening of February 1st and ends on the evening of February 2nd. That's when the ancient Celts celebrated it. According to Lady Wild, it was the 2nd of February when all of the real raucous Imbolc festivities took place. And that raucousness is what led the Catholic Church to hijack the holiday. To quote Wilde, Candlemas Day, the 2nd of February, used to be held in the old pagan times as a kind of Saturnalia with dances and torches and many unholy rites. But these gave occasion to so much ill conduct that in the 9th century the Pope abolished the festival and substituted for it the Feast of the Purification of the Blessed Virgin when candles were lit in her honor, hence the name of Candlemas. And that comes from the book Ancient Legends, Mystic Charms, and Superstitions of Ireland, 1919. How did Inbulk inspire Groundhog Day. It may seem like a stretch to go from milking ewes and lighting torches to monitoring hibernating rodents, but there is actually a very reasonable connection between Imbolc and Groundhog Day. Because it marked the beginning of spring and the beginning of a new farming season, Imbolc slash Bridges Day was a time to monitor one's surroundings and make predictions about the weather. As Irish folklorist Kevin Danaher explains, in Irish folk tradition, St. Bridges Day, the 1st of February, is the first day of spring and thus of the farmer's year. It is the festival of Ireland's venerated and much-loved second patron saint, the first being St. Patrick, who is also the patroness of cattle and of dairy work. A relaxation of the rigors of winter weather was expected at this time. The farmers now hoped for good weather to speed the spring plowing and digging. Weather signs were carefully noted. The wind direction on the eve of the festival betokened the prevailing wind during the coming year. The festival day should show signs of improving weather, although an exceptionally fine day was regarded as an omen of poor weather to come. And that's from the book The Year in Ireland, Irish Calendar Customs, 1972. And while there's no record of Irish farmers monitoring hibernating rodents in order to make predictions about the weather, there is a record of them monitoring hibernating hedgehogs to do just that. To quote Donaher, to see a hedgehog was a good weather sign, for the hedgehog comes out of the hole in which he has spent the winter, looks about to judge the weather, and returns to his burrow if bad weather is going to continue. If he stays out, it means that he knows that mild weather is coming. That's also from the book The Year in Ireland. That being said, Groundhog Day was not an Irish import. It almost certainly arrived in North America from mainland Europe. In Germany, for example, farmers monitored badgers or bears on the Christian holiday of Candlemas, which falls on February 2nd. The Czech holiday of Romnitsa, which also falls on February 2nd, also saw farmers monitoring badgers and bears, as well as geese and skylarks. According to Yoder, this type of animal-based forecasting evolved from a simpler tradition of monitoring the weather on Candlemas slash Omnitsa, a clear sun any day meant winter weather would continue, which mirrors the Irish St. Bridget's Day tradition. This alignment in February folkloric weather forecasting is no coincidence. As Yoder points out in his book Groundhog Day, these traditions have their origins in a much older Celtic tradition. In bulk. Or 
are, what could be going on here is that before the Proto-Indo-Europeans even broke off into Celtic-speaking and German-speaking branches all those thousands of years ago, there was already a tradition of making predictions about spring's arrival, which was then inherited by both cultural groups, the Celts and the Germanic peoples. Otherwise, one has to assume that the Gaulish Celts, who had the most contact with the Germanic peoples of any of the other Celtic tribes, not only had an in-bulk tradition, but also passed that tradition along to their Germanic neighbors. But as far as I can tell, and please correct me if I'm wrong, only the Gaels, aka the Gaelic-speaking or Goidelic-speaking Celts, are recorded as celebrating in bulk, and the Gaels, as far as I can tell, and again please correct me if I'm wrong, didn't have much contact with ancient Germanic peoples. Of course, that doesn't mean that the Gauls and other Celtic tribes didn't have similar festivals, but given the lack of evidence, we have to entertain the idea that observing the habits of hibernating animals when winter's end is nigh is a practice that could have evolved independently amongst the Germans and the Celts. In which case, the Celts had nothing to do with Groundhog Day, and this video has been a huge waste of time. Or has it been? If you enjoyed this video, please like and comment and basically just tap all of the shiny buttons and by the end of it, make sure you are subscribed to the Irish Myths channel. That really, really helps. And if you want to learn more about the darker side of Irish mythology, check out my book, Irish Monsters in Your Pocket, a tiny little book about Irish dragons, werewolves, vampires, banshees, headless horsemen, and other beastly beings. My name is I.E. Neverday, editor of the short story collection Neon Druid and creator of IrishMyths.com. Thanks for coming out.